Hello, I'm Kyle Caldwell, and this is On The Money, a weekly look how to get the best out of your savings and investments. Joining me is Sunil Krishnan, Head of Multi-Asset at Aviva Investors. So we're going to be discussing why you believe the next 12 months will be a tug of war for markets. So on the one hand, inflation is cooling, while on the other hand, political risks are rising. So to start off, could you give an overview of both of those? Well, in terms of inflation cooling, hopefully people are starting to see some signs of that, not just in the financial pages, but also just in terms of daily living. It does feel as though without prices actually coming down very much, at least the days of really rapid increases in, let's say, the basket of weekly shopping and so on, at least we're, we're kind of through that. And what we're seeing more broadly, if you kind of step back and look at the whole economy, is that there's a range of sources now where the worst of that really rapid acceleration inflation is behind us. So one would be the daily kind of goods that I was talking about. We might also look at the pace of, for example, wage increases, which is still kind of above what you would say is the target inflation level for the Bank of England. But equally, it has come off its highs. And that's a a helpful feature as far as they're concerned, because that feeds very directly into service prices. And then also, if you look perhaps more at the industrial sector in terms of commodity prices worldwide, they've eased off as well. So for example, oil prices are off their highs. And so bringing those things together does feel as though we might be turning a bit of a page. Now, on the other side, talking about risks, I mean, perhaps the most high profile ones, which if you like, are front page of the newspapers are the political ones. So we've seen Investors have to digest quite a lot of news in terms of elections that have happened uh, in the UK or in Europe, elections that are to come in terms of the United States. And, And it does leave investors having to think quite carefully about where might policy change? How can it change? What implications does that have for companies and so on? Now, I'd also add to that, I don't think it's just about risks coming from politics. I think there is also a component of markets and investors having a genuine debate about the health of economic activity. And that is something which has been playing out for much of the summer. I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but also something that I think plays into that tug of war about should we be feeling more positive about investing or more cautious. And in terms of inflation, now that it looks like the inflation battle has finally been won, is this good news for both stock and bond markets? Of course, inflation is known to be the enemy of bond markets. So potentially it's actually has a greater impact for bonds rather than shares? Certainly, if you wind back to 2022, I think one of the reasons that that was a real shock to investors who tried to do the right thing and build a diversified portfolio was the way that rising inflation challenged both stock markets and bond markets at the same time, with investors having to debate rising costs for companies at the same time as interest rates having to go up to fight off inflation. Really not good news for either asset market. The process can work in reverse in the sense that it probably is good news for both shares and bonds if central banks are just having to focus on sustaining growth, can maybe ease off on inflation fighting. That's good news. I think in terms of whether that's all there is to it, as far as the bond market's concerned, that probably is the key story. So for government bonds in particular, where you're not having to depend too much on economic strength, just that news that central banks are no longer fighting inflation so aggressively with interest rate policy tends to be uh, positive. And so, for example, if we look at uh, global uh, bond markets over the last uh, three or four months, essentially in each of the last three or four months, they've been posting gains. So investors starting to get used to this idea. For the equity market, it really depends why inflation is coming down. If it's just a normalization of, for example, supply chains, easing off of some of those one-off effects post-pandemic and the war in Ukraine, that can be good news. But if it's coming because activity is slowing too sharply, then it raises more questions for company profits. And at the same time as inflation cooling, we're seeing interest rates start to decline. We've seen the Bank of England already cut interest rates The US Federal Reserve has not cut interest rates yet at the time of this recording, but the likelihood path for interest rates is down rather than up. Will lower interest rates give those areas of the market that have suffered during higher interest rates a boost? Well, as far as the bond market's concerned, I think we've already started to see that, but the process probably isn't done. It has definitely helped. And as I say, in in some ways, 
bond investors don't need to look too carefully into why interest rates are coming down. It just creates a more favorable backdrop. If cash becomes less attractive, then bonds become more attractive. For the equity market, it will, I think, depend critically on why that inflation is coming down, as we discussed. For example, you're quite right to say that some parts of the market have been challenged by higher interest rates. If you look, for example, at smaller companies where their financing tends to be a bit more biased towards borrowing rather than issuing shares, higher interest rates aren't great news. Now, if they can maintain their revenues at the same time as borrowing costs come down, that's great. I think we need to watch very closely to see if that is in fact the case. There are signs of slowing activity in the markets, not yet indicating, right, we must be headed for a recession. And indeed, a slowdown that doesn't cause recession could be the best of all worlds, maybe is what central banks are hoping for. I think you're also right to say that that theme is one that could have different answers in different places because the theme of lower interest rates is global. Interest rates, as you said, have come down in the UK. We think there's more to go. In the United States, it hasn't started But the Federal Reserve, their central bank, has done everything but promise that interest rates will come down and starting at their next meeting. A number of speakers from their body of officials have made this point. So I do think that we'll probably have to wait to strike the balance between more economically sensitive and more defensive companies. But there will be winners from lower borrowing costs for sure. And just going back to bonds. So when interest rates are cut, the chances are bond prices will rise and yields will fall. That's what usually happens in that scenario. Are there any particular areas of the bond market that you would watch more closely that you think may be more potential winners from lower interest rates? I think uh, at this stage, it becomes important to really focus on which markets might see the sharpest changes in investor expectations. So where maybe we're investors thinking that interest rates were going to stay stable or even rise further. And therefore, when investors are having to adjust their expectations, they often change their positioning uh, quite quickly in a way that leads to good returns in those bond markets. Now, we have for some time actually liked the UK government bond market. Uh, It did feel that at a time when global investors were thinking, well, interest rates might still be on the rise, that the signs of slowing in the UK economy were already there, housing market, job market, And we still don't think that's fully played out. Investors still feel perhaps a little concerned about inflation in the UK. We are more relaxed. The time of speaking, we've seen inflation just nose down below the Bank of England's target. That may not last forever because there's a few one-off effects, but we don't think it's going to rise far above the bank's target and the economy is still slowing. So we still like UK gilt market as a way to build that bond holding in portfolios. The other area that's looking increasingly interesting is the US market. The the government bond market there is the treasury market. And US treasuries have seen a really rapid adjustment of investors who were expecting higher interest rates now saying maybe that's not the case. We have seen them perform well recently, but we think that that potentially has further to run. And in a backdrop of low inflation or lower inflation, I should say, and the prospect of some interest rate cuts over the next couple of years, Are you more optimistic about equity markets or bond markets if you had to pick between the two? Of course, in a balanced portfolio, investors should consider holding both of them as they complement one another. But in terms of, you know, if you had to pick one or the other today, what would you pick? Well, you're really asking me to get the crystal ball out there. But I recognise it is a very important question. I suppose the real headline answer is we have been really positively surprised by the power of productivity and technology gains to drive new sources of profit growth for companies. And we don't really think that that process has run its course yet. So in that regard, we do think that that is a very important source of continued returns to the stock market. And we do expect in the next few years, as in the long run, that that will be the dominant theme and that remains the main engine of growth in long-term savings portfolios. That said, the area that might need the most rethinking probably going back to what we were saying about the change in the interest rate environment is the bond portfolio. So it may be that the place where investors need to take another look most rapidly is bonds. But if you're starting from a balanced position, then a tilt towards equities, in our view, does make sense. Let's now move on to political risk. So 2024 is an historic election year. More than half of the world's population have the opportunity to vote. And over the next couple of months, all eyes, of course, will be on the US election 
So how can investors navigate the expected increase in volatility that's expected to happen when the US elections take place? Well, you sort of have two choices. One is to try and predict an outcome, and the other one is to try and make sure that you're not predicting an outcome. We tend to favour the second, and I guess the reason for that is if you take the current presidential campaign as an example, firstly, it really isn't very clear from the polls as to who's going to win. Secondly, because the candidates want to say as little as possible about detailed policy, it's not clear about what they want to do if they do win. And thirdly, because it's not clear how the presidential result will marry up with what's happening in their congressional houses, it's not clear what they'll be able to do if they win. So for those reasons, what we're really trying to do is make sure that portfolios are quite well balanced in some of the key themes and risks that there are. So just to give you a couple of quick examples there, we do think that the international relationship between the US economy and other economies is going to come under scrutiny. The Trump campaign has talked quite openly and frequently about revisiting tariffs on uh, US imports of overseas goods. And therefore, it seems likely that it will create challenges for international companies, I say international to the US, if we're looking at a Trump administration that has a fairly free hand. So one of the things that we don't want to do is be too heavily biased in portfolios towards parts of the world which rely heavily on free-flowing global trade. For example, in portfolios where we take active decisions like our Math Plus range, we're quite cautious on emerging markets right now. They're very dependent on two engines. Firstly, healthy global trade. Secondly, a strong Chinese economy at a time when the Chinese economy is actually looking to be struggling. So that would be an area where we're trying to manage risk quite carefully. On the other side of the ledger, the Democrats have taken their time not just to figure out the policies, but also figure out the person. But we are now starting to hear a little more from the Harris campaign. And some of the areas that will come under scrutiny there are particularly tax policies as it applies to corporate rates of tax uh, and maybe to some of the personal taxes. So we'll need to watch quite closely which companies have been the key beneficiaries of those and therefore maybe more in the spotlight. Here we might think about, for example, the bigger tech companies have benefited both from the tax regime and also from a regulatory regime that is likely to tighten in the coming few years. So that's the kind of risk that we're trying to manage, but not betting too heavily on any one outcome. And in terms of managing risk, there are some ways that investors can have protection in their portfolios. One of those is gold, which some investors view as the ultimate safe haven investment. What are your thoughts on gold as a small part of a diversified portfolio? Well, I suppose we have to start with a disclaimer, which is that in some of our portfolios in the Math Plus range, we do own gold. And we own it in a similar way to what you just described. So we try not to mess around with the holding too much. We see it as a fairly core uh, strategic holding. I guess the key point is gold has a habit of disappointing if you expect it to work on a particular day. So, for example, if the government reports inflation data and the inflation numbers are a bit higher and you think, brilliant, that's going to work for my gold holding, it may not. Or if markets are volatile and let's say the stock market drops by a few percent on a day and you go, oh, I can't wait to see how the gold's done and it hasn't necessarily performed. It doesn't have that kind of relationship with market volatility. However, we do think that partly because of its history, stretching back over thousands of years and the breadth and depth of the types of investors who are willing to look at it, it does have a certain role where investors become uncertain in our view, particularly about policy and about the monetary regime. How is the central bank thinking about responding to current circumstances? That tends to be quite a positive time uh, for gold. And it's hard to predict exactly when that is. But our experience has been there have been quite a few times, particularly over the last three to five years, when a small holding has provided a little bit of uplift at a time when maybe other assets have struggled. And how is it that you gain exposure to gold? Is it through an exchange trade or commodity fund? We will, typically, yes. And I'm sure your listeners will be able to find their preferred flavour. But yeah, we do find that quite an efficient way to gain access and means that we don't need to have quite so much room in the basement. And while political risk, of course, it creates uncertainty, elections can also present potential opportunities for investors. Are you seeing any potential opportunities in terms of if it's a Democrat or a Republican administration? Are there any certain sectors that you're looking at that you think they may benefit? 
Well, opportunities are always a function of how investors behave. What we try and do, particularly with regard to events, is, as I say, we don't want to carry too much of a bias going into the result, but we want to be very open to opportunities that may arise. And so if we think about examples of that, where potentially the day one reaction could be too strong and therefore we might find a pricing opportunity, an area that we have liked for a long time and have done a lot of research on is the healthcare sector in the United States. We think that over and above some of the real headline grabbers like uh, the, the new generation of weight loss drugs, that the pace of innovation has really picked up in the healthcare sector. Now, we know that investors do tend to worry, particularly about democratic administrations, that potentially they will come down hard on the sector in an effort to try and manage healthcare costs and medical costs for US citizens. So it's possible that we might see investors concerned, let's say, by a Democrat victory and express that by selling the shares. Now, we would see that potentially as an opportunity simply because there are a lot of long-term themes that are playing out in terms of technology, as I mentioned, demographics, people's demand for healthcare is going up, not down, where potentially we get an opportunity. But it's very hard to say when that will happen. We just need to be ready when it does. My thanks to Sunil. And thank you for listening to this episode of On The Money. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a rating or a review and follow the show in your podcast app. And if you get a chance, tell a friend about it too. You can join the conversation, ask questions and tell us what you would like to talk about via email on otm at ii.co.uk. And in the meantime, you can find more information and practical pointers on how to get the most out of your investments on the Interactive Investor website which is ii.co.uk. See you next week.